talked uh, a little bit last week about we have the mind of Christ, and that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We got, uh, I don't know, halfway through my notes or a third of the way through my notes, and I wanted to just build on that a little bit more. It's an amazing, amazing subject. I'm super interested in it. It may seem a little bit, you know, theological at first, like what does this have to do with my daily life? Uh, but it turns out it has a lot to do with our daily life as believers, as we kind of really learn the mind of Christ and how he thinks, right? Uh, Every thought from the mind of Christ is a breakthrough thought for us personally. It just is. It's a victory thought. It's a breakthrough thought. It's a growth thought. It brings us uh, freedom and empowerment and clarity and faith and vision and all kinds of things. So learning to uh, kind of access the mind of Christ is actually a really big deal. Uh, let's start in, uh, just want to review 1 Corinthians 2.16, where we started last week. Uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, starts off with a quote or a question from the Old Testament, for who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. The idea being there, of course, that question is who knows the mind of God, and the answer, especially under the Old Covenant, was nobody. Nobody knows God's mind, right? Nobody can ex understand that mind with our tiny, finite little minds. Uh, but then he says this amazing thing, but we... And that just changes everything, because but means something changed, right? And that was the new covenant, that was the cross, uh, Jesus on the cross, our forgiveness, uh, the resurrection, our new birth, our eternal life, the Spirit of God coming to live inside of us in the new covenant. And so, but we, believers in, now in Christ, we have the mind of Christ. And that's just an amazing thing. Uh, I want to review a few of the really top ideas from last week first, uh, get us back on the same page with this. When, we, when it says we have the mind of Christ, it does not mean that it's automatic, does it? Uh, when we get born again, we don't instantly have all of our thoughts full of truth and clarity and love and power and, and faith, do we? Uh, sometimes we get born again, we're, our head is just as much a mess five minutes later as it was five minutes before, right? And it takes some time, right? So what we do have is access to the mind of Christ. And I used the example last week. Access is just like if you have a million dollars in the bank. It'd be nice, huh? Uh, it doesn't mean you're carrying around a million dollars cash in your pocket. It means you have a debit card or a checkbook and you access that money, right? And so it's kind of the same thing. We can access the mind of Christ and the way he thinks and his breakthrough thoughts about everything. The way we access that is through the Bible and through the Holy Spirit, uh, particularly the Holy Spirit connects us, literally, truly connects us to the mind of Christ. This is pretty fun. Uh, so we learn to access it. It's not automatic. Um, most of our thinking here on earth, we grow up in a very broken, sin-infected world, a dark place. Most of our thinking as we grow up in this world is just wrong. Most of our thinking is just a total mess in this world. Huh? It's wrong. It's product of darkness and deception and brokenness. And uh, our thinking is full of fear and limitation and possibilities and pride and selfishness and anxiety and all, right, all kinds of craziness um, in this broken world. And then Jesus comes and says, I'm going to teach you to think. I'm going to start over. I'm going to teach you to think. Right? Turns out that's kind of a challenge, isn't it? Right? But we want to be up for the challenge. We want to recognize that's part of the deal because, as I always like to emphasize, not, we're not called to a religion. We're called to the man Jesus Christ. We're called to the person of Jesus Christ personally. We grow in relationship with him. We grow in relationship with God the Father, knowing his heart, knowing his presence, knowing his voice. We grow in this very personal relationship. Uh, and it's very transforming to us. Simultaneously, we are also called to learn to think like Jesus. Right? And that's called the mind of Christ. Uh, the definition of the mind of Christ is a man, a human being, who has a mind, a uh, working mind that is completely in agreement with God. None of us are there yet, right? But we're on the road, aren't we? And uh, Jesus, as, as a man, he, the Bible says in Philippians 2, we'll read that in a moment, that he basically came to the earth as a man, limited himself, born as a man, living as a man, ministering as a man. And so he did not come with the mind of God, his own divine mind and awareness. He came with the mind of a man. He had to learn the mind of the Father, access the mind of the Father as he's growing up and then walk in that. But since he is not sin infected, he is not a product of this world, even though he became human like us, uh, he had a mind that was completely in agreement with God the Father. Turns out there's a whole lot of victory in that, huh? 
There's an amazing amount of, because the power of God, the spirit of God flows through the thoughts of God much better than it flows through our defeated, fearful, anxious, limited thoughts, right? It just does, right? Uh, it's one of the points I just really want you to get here. And so uh, thinking with the mind of Christ is not automatic, and, uh, and, but a disciple, a disciple kind of grabs onto that and says, I want to learn that, right? I want to grow in it. I want to grow in how Jesus thinks and thinking with his mind, with his truth, with his perspective, with his understanding, right? With what he says is true rather than what my mind says is true. Because remember the, you know, the, the way Jesus thought his, his discipleship program was a whole lot about teaching his disciples how to think, right? They're in the boat crossing the big lake and the storm comes and their thought is panic, we're going to die. And Jesus, you apparently don't care. Right? And that Jesus thought was, this is a small interruption, but a teachable moment. Storm, peace, be still. All right, there you go, guys. What do you think? <laughs> and they're flipping out. Right? They're just completely flipping out. They don't even know what to think. Right? And moment after moment after moment was Jesus teaching them how to think, not, even in miracle, not just in miracle times, but also just in regular thinking times. Right? One of the examples would be kids. Remember the story where children are swarming Jesus, right? Parents are bringing their kids, touch my child, bless my child. And Jesus is hugging them and touching them and blessing them. And the disciples say, get rid of the rugrats. Get rid of the, get rid of the short people. They're bothering us. They're not important. And Jesus goes, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> You're not getting this at all, right? They're important. They're valuable. They're created in God's image. They're precious. And, and I'm going to bless them. They're going to grow up in this world and be amazing, right? And be uh, enormous, uh, great potential. And they're precious. And so Jesus teaches them how to think. So it just turns out that our thinking is just basically wrong in so many ways when we first come to Christ. But we're very dug into our thinking, aren't we? Like, I know what I know. I've seen what I've seen. I believe what I believe. And somebody taught me this. And somebody taught me this. Whatever. And uh, most of what we believe is just wrong. Right? And then Jesus starts teaching us how to think. And I, I like to point out again, I'm not talking about positive thinking. Positive thinking, as this world teaches it, is rooted in absolutely nothing. Right? Just nothing at all. But learning to think with the mind of Christ is rooted in really God's mind, God's truth, God's perspective, God's, right, God's thoughts. When you learn to speak, think with God's thoughts, it's a pretty big deal, isn't it? And every thought from the mind of Christ is a breakthrough thought. Every thought from the mind of Christ. Because we, you know, we're struggling with something and we don't know. I'm still, I'm still reviewing last week. <laughs> but we're struggling with something and I don't know the answer and I don't know how to, you know, how to get there and I don't know how to get the breakthrough and I don't know what to do. And we struggle with something. And if you access, like, Holy Spirit, help me, right? Show me in the Bible and, and give me access to, the, to what Jesus thinks about this, my situation, my problem right now, my challenge. And when that clarity comes, when that mind of Christ is revealed to you for your challenge, breakthrough, huh? Instant breakthrough. Instant clarity, faith, vision, understanding. I know what to do. I know how to do it. I'm going forward. It's just a, it's a very powerful, powerful thing, right? Uh, and we're not just learning to th understand his thoughts from a distance, right? Because sometimes you can do that with, like, read the Bible and just, I'm getting, I'm seeing God's thoughts written down in these words in the Bible. That's great. That's great. But it's more than that. Uh, the Holy Spirit gives you access to the mind that wrote the Bible. The Holy Spirit gives you access to the mind that wrote those words and that spoke those words. <laughs> so you get to read the words. You also get access to the mind that produced it. How good is this, right? So I'm a big believer in the Bible, obviously. Uh, beginning to end, it's God's final word on everything as far as I know, as far as I believe. And uh, nevertheless... The Holy Spirit gives us access to the mind that produced that. <laughs> right? So Jesus is going to relearn you how to think. And it's powerful. And lots of Christians don't want to go there, really. Lots of Christians, we get stuck. Our thinking is limited. Our thinking is self-pitying. Our thinking is defeated. Our thinking is small. Our thinking is impossibilities. And a lot of times we're kind of dug into that and even feel pretty good about it. Right? And, uh, and Jesus goes, um, I got something better for you. But you got to choose it. You got to say yes, right? Yeah, you got to say yes, or you can stay stuck in, dug in, stay dug into your your uh, small thinking, and you can go to heaven in the end, trusting in Jesus, right? But wouldn't you rather learn the mind of Christ and walk in more victory and more breakthrough and more faith and more clarity and more? 
more influence and more. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's discipleship, though, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And I've learned, too, from experience that when I'm presented with a thought that's from Jesus that's, you know, whether in the Bible or he's speaking to me, kind of, you know, personal revelation, when he's speaking to me and it's a higher thought than I'm used to, it's a higher thought than I'm walking in right now, uh, you might relate to this. Isn't there kind of an internal struggle in us? Isn't there sort of a resistance that rises up? and like, oh, no, I know what I know. And I believe what I believe. And I'm, you know, and we're very confident about what we believe. And even though all of our thinking is broken, <laughs> all of our thinking is just wrong from this world, right? And yet somehow we defend it because I know it. I'm comfortable. I'm dug in, whatever it is, right? And so we have to purposely choose. I'm going to think like Jesus. I'm going to learn to think like Jesus. I'm going to choose what he says. I, I had a personal uh, personal experience with this when I was a pretty new believer, my initial encounter with God was a very powerful love encounter, right? And I experienced that love, but that didn't mean that I instantly believed it fully and trusted it fully. As a young Christian, I had a lot of times where I wasn't sure that God loved me, even though I had felt it, tasted it, you might relate. I just kind of walked in that doubt and that insecurity about, did God love me enough? You know, or it was, how real was this? And, uh, I remember that God just, uh, he, he started really breaking through and speaking to me about this love, and but I had to choose it. I had to side with it on purpose. You know what I'm saying? Because part of me was going, no, no, I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. How could you possibly love me? I haven't, I'm not, I'm not this, I'm not that, right? And you might relate. And so, but I had to choose to believe that God loved me because he's speaking this to me and I'm choosing to believe it, even though there's a fight going on inside of myself. You know what I'm talking about. So yeah, there's something in us that will resist, but we choose to side with God, embrace what God says, embrace what God thinks, and uh, go forward, fight that battle a little bit, right? And uh, the Holy Spirit will help you because he gives you revelation and he makes it real to you. But choosing it goes a long way. It just does, right? Uh, that's that's the, um, the definition of the word repentance, by the way. I, I haven't even gotten to the other scriptures yet, but I'll get there. The definition of the word repentance is very connected to what we're talking about right now. Because uh, we tend to think in religious terms of repentance as I'm bad, but I'm going to try to be good. You know, kind of something like that. Or I'm doing bad and I'm going to try to do good. Uh, the word repentance in the Bible, the, Bible's the New Testament is written in Greek. And the word repentance is the word metanoia, which means to change your mind. <laughs> it just means to change your mind. What that means is uh, when God presents me with a truth, a higher thought, and a truth from his mind that I disagree with based on the way I think, uh, repentance means I break agreement with what I believe and I admit, okay, what I believe is wrong. The way I think is wrong, right? I may be very dug into it and very used to it, but the way I think, the way I'm thinking is wrong and what God thinks and what God says is right. And when you break agreement with a lie, something wrong and you make agreement with what God says, what God thinks, you have repented. But then re that, that breaking, that old agreement, making the new agreement changes your behavior. Because we do tend to act on what we really think and believe, don't we? We may say, I believe this, but the way we act really is based on what we actually think and actually believe. And we're all in the process of being changed in that, aren't we? You know, so it, I'm not like, you know, going to thunder up here, hypocrites, everybody, you know, no, we're all, we all do that. We all do that, right? We're all in the process of being changed as Jesus presents us with truth and we come into agreement quickly or slowly, <laughs> right? So that's, uh, oh, that's all kinds of thoughts that I wanted just to share before I get to the verse. Oh, I got one more thought I want to share before I get to the verse, next verse, which is, I mentioned it last week to you too, uh, is that I am a big fan of listening to other preachers and teachers that think higher than I do in Christ. Again, I'm not talking about worldly positive thinking. It's rooted in absolutely nothing, zero. But when I, I you know, I listen to other preachers and teachers, right? And I want to hear what they have to say. And uh, if I listen to somebody, I'm like, oh, you don't think any higher than I do. I'm like, God bless you. You know, God bless you in your ministry, but I don't have time for that. I'm going to find somebody who's thinking higher than me and is walking higher than me and is more, more influential and more effective than me. And I'm like, okay, you're the one I want to listen to because that I'm purposely accessing the mind of Christ through somebody else who is walking in higher, right? 
higher thinking than I am. Uh, I'm a big fan of that. Uh, but it, there's a little bit of an act of humility there of saying, I recognize that this other person thinks higher than me, knows God's mind better than me. So I'm going to humble myself and listen, even though I'm a preacher too. And we all do that. Like, you know, I'm a big fan of listening to someone who thinks higher than you in Christ. Not worldly junk, but in Christ. Big fan of it. It stretches us, huh? It does. Yeah. The, again, the mind of Christ is a man who walks in the mind of God, who walks in the truth of God. Powerful thing. Uh, I also want to emphasize that none of us are all the way there yet. You know, so if you're gonna if you're gonna start jogging and you compare yourself to somebody who's an Olympic track runner, you're gonna come up real short, right? Or if you're you know you're gonna start working out and you've got a muscle like this, but you compare yourself to you know a bodybuilder on stage, you're gonna come up pretty short. But the important thing is when you decide to grow, as long as you're growing, as long as you're moving forward, you're good, right? Right? Yeah, yeah. Because otherwise, it could always come up terribly short. Uh, growing is good. Wherever you're at, however defeated your thinking is, however confused your thinking is, as a believer in Jesus still, go forward. Choose to access the mind of Christ and see what he thinks about your life, your situation, your thinking, and go for the next victory, go for the next breakthrough, go for the next truth, go for what he wants to speak to you, right, and lead you into to walk in. Uh, it's just so worth it. Every thought from the mind of Christ is a breakthrough thought. Right? Every thought from the mind of Christ is a victory thought. We'll talk more about that too. Uh, oh, let's see. Mm, Philippians 2, 5 through 9. Let's uh, start here today. So that was all just review, I think. Anyway, Philippians 2, Paul wrote, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Ooh, that's good, huh? It's exactly what we're talking about, isn't it? We have the mind of Christ. And he says, let this mind be in you. Again, it's not automatic. It's something we choose to access and open ourselves to, right? It's something we, yeah, we go after. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has also, also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. So I want to unpack this a little bit. So when he says, uh, obviously when he says, let this mind be in you, the mind of Christ, that's directly connected to what we're talking about. It's something we choose, it's something we lean, lean into to, to learn and to, to learn to think ourselves. Uh, but I looked up the word mind, it's very interesting. And, it, and uh, you know, sometimes... These words in uh, the original language have a little bit more depth of meaning, right? And uh, that, that's cool. This word, mind, it means, really, I'm not even making this up. This is totally true. <laughs> that, the, that, that word means a way, of, a way of thinking or understanding that leads to action. That gets fleshed out in action in, in some way, right? And it, so it's not just thought. It's understanding or thought that produces Action, behavior, right? So that's very, that's very powerful. So let that mind thinking in you that produces action be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who Now verse 6 says, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. And this is the New King James Version, which I normally like a lot. Uh, but that particular verse, is, that's a terrible translation, honestly. And it's okay to say that. The original is Greek, and that's the inspired part. Translations are you know, sometimes have weaknesses. And so uh, I'm not a huge fan of that translation at all. Uh, some of the other uh, New American Standard is better. I think ESV is better. Because uh, we don't even know what that means, do we? <laughs> right? uh, it made sense to somebody at some time. But I looked, up, I looked up the original Greek there and just, you know, you can do that very easily online. It's super easy. And, uh, and I wrote a better paraphrase. I genuinely think this is a better... Uh, expression of what it means from the Greek. And I'm going to read it to you. Uh, Jesus, who existed in the form of God as an equal member of the Trinity, did not consider his equality with God as something that he must hold on to. But he was willing to let it go. And instead, he took a lower place and he came into the earth as a human being 
and as an obedient bondservant of God the Father. I'm going to read it again. <laughs> Jesus, who existed in the form of God as an equal member of the Trinity. Here's the point that I think is translated badly. But the real meaning is he did not consider his equality with God as something to be held on to at any cost. But he was willing to let it go, took a lower place, came into the earth as a man like us, and walked in obedience to God the Father to redeem us. Yeah, that's so, so cool. Wow. Uh, so then it goes on. He made himself, yeah, of no reputation, took a lower position, took the form of a bondservant, came in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. The name of Jesus, every tongue will confess he is Lord, every knee will bow. Right? And so uh, the, the, the expression here of have, have this mind, let this mind be in you, the mind of Christ, means know, know God's ways, know how God works, right? And Jesus modeled this and fleshed this out for us, that even though he's God, he came as a servant. He came... It was a man of no reputation, right? Instead of coming into earth with thunderings and lightnings and glory and angels and, you know, he came born in a manger. He lives as a common man in so many ways and, uh, and, and humble and obeys the Father, serves man, comes as a Savior. But the end result is that God the Father exalts him up to the highest place, right? As a man, as a man. He abandoned, or not abandoned, he surrendered his place as God and came as a man, and then is restored to his place, but now in a man's body. So what does that have to do with us? Actually, quite a bit, because you, as a born-again person, isn't it true? The Bible says you are now seated with Christ in heavenly places. You're actually robed with righteousness now, seated with Christ now, crowned right now. You are. You're a born-again child of God with a high position in the universe and creation. You are. And yet, the same thing, we are willing to right? To come and serve. We're willing to do the Father's will. We're willing to be a blessing to other people. We're willing to take a, a position where we're not recognized at this moment for who we are, right? But we're a blessing. And uh, God says, as you have that humble heart and you're a blessing and a servant to the people around you, ultimately, I will exalt you for that. <laughs> the mind of, of the earth is, I will exalt myself, Right? But God says, those who exalt themselves will be humbled. But God says, those who humble themselves will be exalted. Right? So have that mind of Christ. Understand God's way and calling and his ultimate desire to exalt you. Right? But, uh, but how, how to be there, how to get there. Uh, very cool stuff. Just learning how God thinks is so empowering, isn't it? Um, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. Uh, I read it last week, but I want to just reread it for a moment and build on it again. God said, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Okay, very, I just love the clarity of this verse. It tells us that God's, you know, I, I, I almost said like, you know, God is from heaven. That's not true. God created heaven, but he does abide in heaven, right? And uh, heaven is higher than the earth. The earth was corrupted, fallen, darkened, you know. Uh, sin infected, and and the way of thinking from this earth is very broken, very limited, very dark. Uh, but God says, uh, my thoughts are so much higher than yours. I'm not burdened with the confusion and the darkness and the deception of earth. And Jesus came uh, with that mind uh, of God as a man. And so he's always pulling our thoughts higher, isn't he? He just is. When he reveals something to you, it comes to you at a place where you're struggling with the problem and you're, you've got earthly thinking in some way. You just do. You got earthly thinking. It's limited. It might be partially blinded at whatever it is. It might be selfish. It might be fearful. It might be proud. It might be, I don't know. Our thinking is messed up. And the Lord comes to you with his clarity, his thought, his truth, his perspective and speaks it to you. And it's always higher, but we have to humble ourselves and repent, you know, metanoia, change our mind and say, God, I'm willing to have a new thought here. I'm willing to have a whole new understanding, right? Powerful thing, right? Uh, so G, uh, Jesus actually kind of refers to this a little bit in John chapter 8, 21 to 25. I want to read that. So during his ministry, 
Uh, Jesus is, uh, is teaching the, you know, the crowds. But here in, in 8, he's specifically speaking at this moment, at least, to the Pharisees, who, you know, the, the religious leaders of the day who basically reject him. They don't believe in him. They're, uh, they're trying to trip him up and get rid of him. Uh, so Jesus said to them again, I'm going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. <laughs> Ooh, that's hard. Uh, what's he saying? Uh, I'm going to go back to heaven soon. I'm here for just a little while. I'm going to go back to heaven and you will seek me. Not meaning seek him to know him and believe in him. Meaning, where did he go? <laughs> right? But he says, you're going to die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. You can't, you're not going to go to heaven. Wow. Okay, go ahead. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Because he says, where I go, you cannot come. They're mocking and they don't want to believe him and they don't want to understand him. And he said to them, Here's the part that's, that's uh, kind of reflective of Isaiah 55, what we just read. Jesus said to them, you are from beneath. I am from above. Oh, you are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Actually, with the, the he is italicized and added in and, you know, right, for English benefit. But I think you could leave it out. He says, for if you do not believe that I am. And that's how, that's how God introduced himself to uh, Moses at the burning bush, right? I am. <laughs> and Jesus said, if you don't believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Wow. And then they said to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, just what I've been saying to you from the beginning. In other words... I've been telling you over and over and over, and you don't want to believe me. You can ask me a question again that I've already, I've already told you. I've already told you. You're not, you don't. Go back to uh, 24, please. He says, you're going to die in your sins. You're from beneath. Your thinking is full of darkness and pride and selfishness and limitation and impossibilities and unbelief. And your thinking is so darkened. I'm from above. And I'm telling you something that's true. And you're just unwilling to believe me, even though I'm telling you over and over. And you're going to die in your sins. <sighs> but if you will be willing to believe that I am who I said I am, I'm from heaven, I'm, right? If you're willing to believe that I am the, the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of God, God incarnate, if you're willing to believe something higher, you'll be saved. So, this is, this is the call of, you know, God from the higher place, right? Place calling us to let go of our unbelief, let go of our, our stubbornness and pride and dark, whatever it is. And he says, be willing to believe me. But this applies to us even when we're born again, huh? Even when we have accepted Jesus, we do believe in Jesus. Are we still dug into some of our thinking, though? Yes, absolutely. And Jesus still says to us, you know, you're, you're saved, right? You, you belong to God now. You're going to heaven. But, but he says, um, could we raise you higher, please? Right? Can this not be just you go to heaven when this is over? Can we raise your thinking up? Are you willing to receive what I say from heaven that I speak truth? If Jesus speaks something to us that is his thinking, and he, and he speaks to us, and we have our thinking, who's probably right? You know, <laughs> and yet we have this human tendency, like, no, I know I'm right. I know I'm right. You know, what, whatever Jesus said, it's not what he meant, you know. And we take what Jesus said, and we lower it way down to where it's agreeable to us. We lower it way down to where it's like, I, I can wrap my head around that, you know. Jesus said crazy things from our perspective, like, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And even greater works, because I'm going back to the Father. The Holy Spirit's coming upon you, right? And, and we look at it, and we go, oh yeah, Jesus said that, and that must apply to somebody somewhere, but not to me. And he certainly didn't mean I'll actually do, you know, greater works. He meant I'll do like, you know, you know what I'm saying? We, we just somehow in our head, we just tear it all down to where we're comfortable with it, and it doesn't challenge us, it doesn't stretch us, and we don't have to say yes. <laughs> but Jesus says, can you just say yes? Can you just believe that I, when I speak to you, like take the highest possible interpretation and go with it? Don't take the lowest possible interpretation to make yourself comfortable. Take the highest possible interpretation. I actually mean, yes, he who believes in me will do the works that I do and even greater works. I go to the Father. The Holy Spirit's coming on you. Dare to believe it. Even if you don't walk in it right away, just dare to believe it and say yes, for starters. And then he's like, I'll get you there. I'll work, right? 
You see what I'm saying here? Be willing to believe what comes from on high when he speaks to us. Because he's always stretching us. He's not leaving us in our comfortable little, I've got it all figured out box. He's just not. He's going to kick that box and stomp on it and smile and go, higher. You want to go higher? <laughs> right? So that's our lifetime. Again, as long as you're growing, it's good. That's, that's what really matters, right? It's not that you're all the way there and you're, you know, fabulous and thinking like Jesus all the time. I'm not there either. But as long as you're growing and keep saying yes to God, it's good. It's good. It's good, right? Oh, yeah. Um, Colossians 1.18. How are we doing? We're okay. Colossians 1.18 uh, simply says that he, Jesus, is the head of the body the church. And I'll just stop it there for the moment, because that's the point I want to make, is, again, you're not just a Christian who's reading a book and learning God's words, learning God's thoughts. That is not just what this is. You are a member of the body of Christ. You are literally connected to Jesus, who is the head now, and the connection is the Holy Spirit. Plain and simple, right? When you're born again, the Holy Spirit's in you. The Holy Spirit's in God the Father. The Holy Spirit's in Jesus. He, connect, he lives in you. He connects you. You are literally connected to Jesus. You are literally connected to the mind that gave us the Bible, right? To the mind that gave us those words and those thoughts. So, yeah, right? That's why I encourage you, don't just make it a mental exercise to read the Bible and try to understand it. Uh, access the mind of Christ through the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, teach me. Guide me, reveal to me, give me understanding, show me, right, every breakthrough that I need, show me in God's word, show me in the mind of Christ, every breakthrough that I need, every victory that I need, every kind of step of growth that I need, because every thought from the mind of Christ is a breakthrough thought in some way. It'll bust you forward. It just will. It just will. We, we, we generally know when we're struggling with something, don't we? I think I said this last week. But, but we, I'm struggling with a problem. I'm struggling with a question. I don't know how to fix this. I don't know the solution. I don't know the breakthrough. We know when we're in that spot. But when, when you access the mind of Christ and the Holy Spirit gives you that clarity through the Bible or through a rhema word, the, the mind of Christ comes to you. It's a breakthrough thought and it settles it. And you're like, oh, I got it now. Like now I know that I got it. I'm not struggling. I'm not confused. I'm not depressed. Right. Uh, did I talk to you about Jesus' emotions, or was that first service? That was first service. So, yeah, a really interesting thought here. Did you notice in the, in the life of Jesus that he had very human emotions, didn't he? Like when Lazarus died, Jesus weeps over the pain, everybody's feeling, the loss, the tragedy, fully knowing that he's going to raise him from the dead minutes later. But he feels the emotion of it, doesn't he? And then when Jesus was grieved by the Pharisees, their hardness of heart or their hypocrisy, grieved and even angered sometimes. And when he goes to the cross, right? I mean, the absolute dread of what he's facing there as a human being, anticipating what this is going to be like, the dread that he feels in God, Father, if there's any other way, right? He's feeling very real human emotions. Not all of them are positive. And yet, in the mind of Christ there's still victory in truth. In the mind of Christ, there's still clarity. It's so powerful to understand that he can feel very human emotions, not, sometimes not, not positive ones, right? But appropriate for the moment. He feels pain, loss, frustration, anger even, at injustice and you know, the Pharisees, their hardness of heart. But yet his mind was clear with the will of God. Doesn't deviate him, doesn't defeat him doesn't take him down. He doesn't have confusion or depression. Jesus was never depressed, was he? Locked himself in his room for a day because he just couldn't get out of bed. Ever no. Like he has, the mind of Christ is a mind of clarity. Even though you can have very real human emotions, and even though you can feel very real, like, I don't really want to go to the cross. But I think it's helpful. It's helpful to me, right? Yeah. Uh, that's the mind of Christ. I've, I've got clarity. I've got clarity. I'm going forward. Um, Jesus, his mind was always victory. It didn't always look like victory. Um, when he's going to the cross, does it look like victory? <laughs> to us now it does. But at the time, you know, does, for anybody who's watching him be, be arrested, be falsely accused, be sentenced to death, be, they're, they're whipping him, they're nailing him to a cross, he's being lifted up on a cross, does it look to anybody watching like victory? No. But in the mind of Jesus, it was victory. This is what I came to do. I'm fully in control of myself. 
I'm in victory. And after this is resurrection and <laughs> a whole new beginning. Bringing people into the family of God, bringing people into the kingdom of God. So, I mean, the mind of Christ is victory, but it's not always victory as we, in, 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 you know, interpret it. Sometimes we're going through a trial. Can we have very real human emotions of like, I'm feeling kind of, of you know, frustrated right now. I'm feeling kind of afraid right now. I'm feeling kind of, wow, you know. Uh, can we go through that and still have victory? Still be in, yes, yes, we can. The mind of Christ is still victory. It's not the mind of Christ that when we give up, we change directions, we fall down, we walk away, we get mad, we, you know what I'm saying? That's when, that's when we mess up. The mind of Christ is a, is a powerful thing. Uh, where am I? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I was, I was going to read 1 Corinthians 2, that passage again, but, uh, but I'm not going to. It's just, basically, I just want to emphasize that the Holy Spirit reveals to us the mind of Christ. The Holy Spirit reveals to us the heart of God, the thoughts of God, the truth of God. Uh, without the Holy Spirit, we, we really are, are very badly handicapped. And I know that's just such a tendency in the body of Christ. I'm going to read the Bible. I'm smart. I'm going to use my brain, right? I'm going to use commentaries. That's probably worse. I read some of the commentaries, you know, on the Bible, and I'm like, you have no idea what this is about, do you? <laughs> and you're published, and you have a PhD in something. And you got no idea what he's saying here, do you? <laughs> I can tell that, because I know the Holy Spirit, right? And how interpreting the Bible in the highest possible way is the best way. Interpreting it in the lowest possible way is the worst way. Interpreting it in the way that requires the most faith is what he always intended. Interpreting the word of God in the way that requires the, le the least faith is always human thinking. It's helpful to some of you. All right. Uh, but, but there are certain guiding principles of the mind of Christ. I've kind of already talked about one. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. I'm okay. It says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is, uh, this is a revelation of the mind of God. Victory, victory, victory. The mind of Christ is always victory. The mind of God is always victory. Just is. Well, you know, he could win every victory. He's God, right? <laughs> but the fact is he wants the victory for you. If you're his born-again child, if you're his covenant man or covenant woman, he wants the victory for you. But could he just wave his hand and suddenly you're walking in total victory? Sure, I guess. But where's the growth in that for you? Where is you going through the process of agreeing with him, believing in him, rising up to a higher place as he speaks to you, right? Stepping out in faith. You know what I'm saying? There's value in the process. We just want the destination. I just want the victory, right? And he says, no, there's value in the process. That when you see the victory and you believe and you agree and you say, yes, Give me the mind of Christ on this victory, the, the next breakthrough, and I'm going to believe you, and I'm going to go through it even though there's resistance, even though it may be hard, even though it may take longer than I want. I'm going to go through the process into victory because thanks be to God who always gives us the victory in Jesus, right? But there's value in the process. We just don't like the process, right? <laughs> I just want to be there. <laughs> but so the mind of Christ is he doesn't want to just drop it on you, the victory. He wants you to grow in him and become victorious and learn to think with victory. And he wants you to have the mind of Christ that is every obstacle, there's a victory. Every resistance, there's a victory. Every problem, there's a victory. Every, right, every confusion, there's a breakthrough. There's a clarity of, that's available to me in the mind of Christ. <laughs> and then I'm going to go forward. That's how he wants you to learn to think. Not defeated, not limited, not resigned to I'll just get by until I go to heaven. Victory. <sighs> But again, you know, as he's going to the cross, did it look like victory? No, but it was. He was in victory. <laughs> you can look like you're going through a pretty hard time sometimes. But if, you're, if you got the mind of Christ, you're in victory. And you know how this ends up. There's another thought um, that is kind of a guiding principle for the mind of Christ. Matthew 8, 5 to 10 is the story, you might all know it, when uh, the, uh, one of the Roman officers came and uh, it says when Jesus had entered Capernaum a centurion came to him pleading with him saying Lord my servant is lying at home paralyzed dreadfully tormented but he comes to Jesus he has compassion and he knows Jesus is the guy to go to but he's a Roman 
And when, uh, go ahead. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Good news. We're done. We're cool. Come to my house. But no, he does something else completely surprising, right? You know the story, maybe? The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. What? For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go. He goes to another, come. And he comes to my servant, do this, and he does it. I understand authority. I understand you're a man of authority. However much he, uh, else he understood or didn't understand, he's, he knew that. Right? And uh, go ahead. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Oh, this is amazing. This is so cool. Jesus celebrates this guy. He's a Roman centurion. He's the oppressor of Israel. But he looks at Jesus and he goes, I know that if you just speak the word, my servant will be healed. The man does have compassion, right? He's not an evil man, but he just works for the Roman government. But he says, you just speak the word, my servant will be healed. And Jesus throws a party. He's like, did everybody see that? Did everybody hear that? And my point is that higher faith is always the mind of Christ. And here a Roman did it, right? By watching Jesus. And comparing it to what he knew. And he got into higher thinking. And Jesus threw a party and celebrated him and made a big example out of him. My point is, growing in faith is always the mind of Christ. Right? So it's always celebrated. Yeah. So, when, whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, all of our life we're going through something, aren't we? All of our life, we're breaking through another thing. We're, we're growing in another way. We're being stretched in another way. We're facing another problem. All of our life, there's value in the process. <laughs> we don't like the process, but there's value in the process. And all the time, Jesus is trying to stretch us. The mind of Christ, higher faith. Believe higher. Believe more. Believe for greater breakthrough. Believe for greater manifestation of his power, his work in your life. Believe for the next breakthrough. Right? It's a mind of victory, but it's also a mind of faith. Because faith means I'm believing you for it on purpose. Right? Yeah. I'm accessing it. I'm trusting you. I'm looking to you. I'm, I'm connecting with you for this breakthrough. I believe it's possible. I believe you have it for me. And I'm going after it. That's the mind of Christ. He will always pull you higher. If you settle for low faith, Jesus will somehow be trying to pull you higher. You can fight him off. Don't. <laughs> right? Let him pull you higher. Let him take you higher. Yes. Uh, that's why I said, uh, you know, one of the common things in the body of Christ and common things in seminary schools and co Bible colleges is interpreting everything in the Bible in the lowest possible way that requires no faith at all. Okay. Did, did God really part the Red Sea? Well, you know, it, it was very shallow and, uh, you know, you know what I'm saying? Dumb stuff, right? No, the highest level of faith, uh, to understand it is, yes, God parted the Red Sea, <laughs> right? And they, they traveled through it on foot. Yes, he did that. Yes, he did that. Uh, always, always interpret the Bible in the way that requires the highest level of faith. Uh, all right, and then the last one is um, John 15 for today, all I want to say. John 15, 12, and 13. Jesus said to his disciples, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. The mind of Christ is always about sacrificial love. Sacrificial meaning self-sacrifice. There is no true expression of love without self-sacrifice. If you get married, are you sacrificing something? Yes. Dating, for instance. You're, you're, you're giving of your time. You're laying down some freedom, aren't you? You're making a commitment that costs you something. Love is always self-sacrifice. If you have children, is there self-sacrifice involved of your free time and your convenience and your comfort and your sleeping in and everything? There is. There's just there are money and uh, every, everything, right? True love always involves self-sacrifice. And the mind of Christ is all about higher expressions of love. Express love in higher ways, in better ways, in bigger ways, involving self-sacrifice. The opposite of that is selfishness, which is very earthly thinking. It's about me. I need me time. I need lots of me time. I need, like, all me time. No, that's, <laughs> no the mind of Christ is more love and more self-sacrifice expressing that love. You'll always find those. In the mind of Christ, you'll always find victory. You'll always find higher faith pulling you up. You'll always find self-sacrificing love. Just for starters, those are three basics. 
Uh, all right. How about uh, let's pray? Yeah? I want to pray. I kept you a little bit late. I'm glad I have the freedom to do that second service. Uh, I just have, you know, a few more things to say. It'll take us till about luau time. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I got about five more minutes for you, but I do want to, I do want us to pray, and then I do want to show you a minute and a half video before we end the service. So, uh, let's pray first. God, thank you that you are revealing to us the mind of Christ, calling us to explore the mind of Christ, learn the thoughts and the thinking of Jesus. Every, every mind of Christ thought is a breakthrough thought. It's a higher thought. It's an empowering thought. It's a clarifying and liberating thought. Those thoughts ended up written down in the Bible, many of them. God, thank you that you're connecting us, Holy Spirit, to the mind of Christ. And so we just pray right now, God, teach us. You could, you could just make that personal and whisper that too. Teach me, God. Teach me the mind of Christ. Holy Spirit, reveal to me the mind of Christ. Breakthrough thoughts. Empowering thoughts. Thoughts that cause me, that bring me to repentance. To surrender some way of thinking that it's not good and to embrace a way of thinking that is from God. Thank you, God, that every, every thought in your mind is victory and faith and love. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, help us to grow and learn and be more effective and more influential. one more moment in this just just ask God what's some something that he wants to do in your life right now a, a, a thought from the mind of Christ that will be a breakthrough for you personally in something you're struggling with something you're challenged by or experiencing ask God for the breakthrough thought the mind of Christ thought for you in your personal life Spirit of God, speak to hearts. Victory thoughts, faith thoughts, love thoughts. Wisdom that we don't have on our own. A new thought that's not a normal thought for us. 